his book, uh, and that's on Kennedy at CGMS uh, timeline. So if you're a Facebook person and you want to create a share or watch party from there, you can, you can go to Facebook in the next 30 seconds, search for Kennedy at CGMS and then share it. Okay, it's already on my own platform, so I'm sharing straight up. Okay, I got, I've done mine. So you can do that as well, uh, so that it can be made available to a few other persons through your generosity. Hallelujah. Okay, let's, uh, sorry, let me take my sip. I, I, my parents said I was born on a Friday. Some, sometimes I think that coffee must have been invented on a Friday because there's just something about coffee and I, you know, we just, we just have chemistry. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, coffee and I would go a long, long, long way, you know. Uh, yeah, I still remember myself at the, uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia airport, you know, I was so eager to go to the Abuna corner, you know, they call coffee Buna, you know, and I hear some stories that say coffee was first discovered in Ethiopia, so I was really eager to go and drink at that uh, Abuna corner in uh, at the airport, you know, and goodness me, I know I've had coffees, I've had espressos, I've had maca, but the Ethiopian coffee, when you sip it, you shake your head because the thing hits you at the medulla, you know. Hallelujah. I see my Iyawumi, Ololufemi. Oh, let me. The black or the yellow one? And the black one this time. I don't put it from <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning, darling. How are you? <laughs> Tinika, uh, I love you. <laughs> no, 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 no. She's trying to talk, but the system has locked her out. Oh, she's zipping up. <laughs> so we can do this is how we do it. <laughs> I love you, Tina. <laughs> You, you you are not feeling for your auntie boost. I don't want you to be heartbroken. You know, I'm um, long um, luxurious buses in, in Nigeria. They will say many have gone. <laughs> many have gone this way. I don't want you to be heartbroken. Many I have already you. gone this way. Auntie Boost, I love you too much. Be warned. Go and ask the other yellow VCD. But if you want to go, not. Uh, you don't know. This is the most special Iyawo that is yellow, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you, hmm. you know, mathematics makes me feel dizzy, but if I call her into the equation, bam, everything is resolved. <laughs> uh, okay, Tosi Babalola is driving. I hope you're not the one on the steering. <laughs> no, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mama T. I actually just quickly jumped in because of Mama T. I mean, chance it. Mama T, I saw you yesterday at our church. Oh, okay. With Pastor Christy. <laughs> I was watching from Lagos, our Lagos branch. Yeah. <laughs> we were watching across all the branches in Nigeria. So all the branches streamed the Abuja, Abuja service. Okay, okay. Yeah, you all do one service. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> well I done, know. Ma. I know. All right. <laughs> Praise God. I know. Good to see you today, Ali. Yes, yes Ma. Okay, let's have uh, the discussion today. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to read from Sam. 
Psalm 139, uh, Psalm 138, beg your pardon, and verse number two. Psalm 138, and in verse two. <clears throat> it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. And here is the submission. There's a colon. So what's on the right-hand side of the colon? Some of what was said on the left-hand side of the colon. It said, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God has magnified his word above all his name. In other words, before he says a thing, he puts everything into considering the implications of what he's about to say, so that if he says it, he will hold himself dutifully bound to what he has said. So his word is magnified above all his name. He would rather oblige his words than to pick a new name. He will stick and do what his word has said. And that is the strength that these laws have. And that's why I said these laws are sacrosanct. They are, they are without respect to individuals. The wicked on their way to hell because they lack salvation, the infidel can practice these laws and prosper in their marital relationships, even though as far as salvation is concerned, they may not uh, enjoy the redemption that we have in Christ. You know, um, I'm quickly reminded of something that you know, the late MKO Abiola used to say, a great giver, a great philanthropist. You know, he wasn't a Christian, great Muslim, great giver. And he used to say something, he said the giving hand is on top. And that's, on, that's unequivocal. You can never say it better. The giving hand is always on top. You don't reduce by giving. You stay on top by giving. So even in your relationships, when you find yourself being put in that very strange corner where the demand is always on you to give and 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 to give. And to give. Just remember that you giving never depletes you. You giving always increases you because the giving hand is always on top. The receiving hand is the one that opens upward to receive from the giver. So don't be afraid to be a giver. These laws are profitable these laws will make your relationships, uh, you know, a better experience. The first law that I want to deal with today, it's my law number one for today, but law number 10 in the count, because we stopped at number nine last week. So the first law I want to deal with is the law of honor. The law of honor. Honor for God honor for man, honor for principles, honor for God, honor for man, that person that you're in relationship with, and honor for principles. A couple of years ago, uh, here in Canada, I was asked the question, what is the one singular thing, one singular factor that doesn't require the assistance of anything else to destroy a relationship? Is it money? Is it sex? Is it uh, adultery? And I said, no, it's not. I say it can't be money because some people, even if you give them all the money in the world, but you forgot to ask them, how are you when they are sick? Your money can't replace that expression of care. For some people, care is far more critical than money. And some people have money already. So you really can't uh, break them using money. I mean, Prince Harry got married you know, just a few years ago. He couldn't have been looking for money in his girlfriend. And the girlfriend wasn't looking for money in him either. 
the same. So they are those who have money. So when God was speaking to us, he spoke these things from the place of the Garden of Eden where there was surplus and nobody needed money. So money cannot break a relationship. It can't. I know we are very, very sensitive when it comes to how we use money, but it can't break us. It can't break a relationship. But guess what? Somebody said, what if it's adultery? I said, no, adultery can't destroy a relationship. Adultery hurts. Adultery is bad. But what if your partner chooses to forgive you? Then the relationship won't break. But guess what can singularly destroy a relationship without being assisted by any other circumstance? It is the word dishonor. When you dishonor God, or when you dishonor that person that you're in relationship with, or when you dishonor the principles that bind the relationship, you are on your way to destroying what you have. You're on your way to destroying it. You know, sometimes I try to compare the characters of God with some of the things that I'm teaching. And here is such a comparison. In the Old Testament, God sent Samuel to ordain Saul as king of Israel. From the shoulder upward, he was the tallest of all the guys. In his build, he looked like Adonis. He was a masterpiece of a human creature that when they say, behold, your king, you just say to yourself, yeah, 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 this got to be king indeed. You know? And God made him king when he thought so little of himself. But as soon as he became king and God said to him, this is what I want you to do for me in your capacity as the king that I have appointed. He went for that battle, came back with the king of Amalek, came back with the most choicest of their cattle. And then one prophet Samuel came to him and said, have you done what God said? He said, yes. So there was the bleating of the sheep in my ear and the mooing of the cows. He said, uh, actually, that wasn't me. It's the soldiers that went with me. They brought these things to come and make sacrifices unto your God. And someone looked at him and said, does God have delight in sacrifice like he has delight in obedience? He said, today, the kingdom would have been established under you. The Messiah would have come as the son of Saul, not son of David. He said, but because you have given consideration more to what others thought, what they felt, beyond what God told you. The kingdom is taken away from you today. And you know the story. Uh, Saul lost the kingdom. Then David was the replacement. Then David, as king, went after Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And after having an affair with her, uh, to cover it up, he sent for Uriah. You know these Bible stories. Eventually, he had Uriah set up for the kill, and he got killed in the battlefront because the note he gave the young man to give to his commander was to set him up, send him on an errand towards the wall of the city that was garrisoned. And um, while they were there, he would signal to the rest of the team to pull back. And Uriah was left alone and got killed. And after that, the prophet Nathan, came and approached David and said, uh, how is it that a man that has hundreds of goats now had a guest visiting him and needed to slay uh, one of the animals for refreshment? How come he didn't take out of the hundred that he has in his barn? Rather, he went and took this little kid goat that was like a pet to the owner, the only thing that he had. And David said, wow, whoever did that, he should die. That's wickedness. And Prophet Nathan said, yes, oh king, that was you. You have multiple wives already. If you wanted more, won't God have given to you? But when the visiting urge came on you, you took Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, and then you had him killed. I love David. He didn't say the verdict should change because he was the one involved. Rather, he repented. And the Bible says, and God said, I know your heart. I've already forgiven you, but the child conceived from this affair because you have disgraced my name, the child will not leave. And I'm like, God, hold on, hold on. One person brought cattle, brought goats, sheep, cows, 
the fattest of them to come and you know lambast your your altar your 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 your, your temple with sacrifices and give you oblations of sweet smelling incense and you took the kingdom from him this is the one he's done the criminal act and you exculpated him and this, what I hear from the spirit is this. It's not the actions when they are weighed. It's the dishonor. It's the dishonor. <laughs> and God retained David. And thousands of years later, his, his Messiah became the son of David. Be careful how you dishonor your spouse. Because the trick about this honor is that it is perceptible even when you think that your tricks are covered. <laughs> it can be perceived. You know, be careful. Be careful how you dishonor principles. I'm telling you. This honor can destroy whatever hard life even the life of God in it. So honor is the one key that you must learn. Honor goes beyond respecting. It goes beyond respecting. It takes it to that special level of holding it as special and there, not in comparison with others. So the law of honor is that even for those of you that are preparing to get married, she's cute, she's slim, she has all the cup size and the hips, everything is so proportionate. But ask yourself, does she honor you? Ask yourself that. I know he looks tall, he looks dark and handsome, he speaks so well. And in church, he speaks in tongues very loud, not at all levels. You know, there's all level tongues. If you then there's A level, very masterful ones. Don't worry, baby girl. We are happy for his spirituality, but ask yourself does this guy honor me? It's key. Honor is key. Honor is key. So that when you hear 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 9, says, uh, <clears throat> do not beautify yourself with the adornment of uh, wearing gold apparel and all of that stuff, uh, but rather that you should invest in the, uh, the inner beauty, inner beauty of that, that inner character. You should invest in that one, not on the outside. Honor is what he's talking about. Look for that person that honors you. Let me push it a little bit further. Since you are not yet married, look for that person that honors your parents. As you have the responsibility on that God to honor your parents so that your days may be long because that's the first commandment that came with a blessing. If you have done well in honoring your parents, don't marry someone who does not honor your parents. Be careful with it. Law number two, which will be number 11 for us today. I call it the law of repair. The law of repair. <clears throat> Each and every one of us must learn to repent and repair instead of replacing. A lot of people are so replace oriented. And any little thing that happens will seek a replacement. You know, the woman uh, in John chapter four, you know, she was such a woman, you know, she was a replacement minded person. So the first one, it didn't work. She replaced him with the second, then second with the third, the third with the fourth, the fourth with the fifth. And by the sixth, uh, she chose that this one, I'm just going to live with him, but we're not going to sign the dotted lines of any marriage commitment. But what she couldn't see was that she was the only common denominator in all the six uh, situations. You know, but if you learn to repair, 
and you repent to repair instead of replacing, you can, <clears throat> you can carry on with what you have so enviably that people will never know that you have problems. I'm telling you. <clears throat> I think it was the summer of uh, the summer of 2020 or the summer of 2019 here. You know, I went to one of those events put together by this uh, vintage car owners, you know, and you see the dates that the car was manufactured, you know, cars from 1932, as far back as that, 100 plus years old cars, but these vintage owners have learned to continue to maintain and replace their parts. And those cars are still running crisp. I'm telling you, like they ran 100 years ago when they were created. Why? Because somebody paid the price to continue to repair and to, and to, and to repent, to repair and to repent, repair and repent. So Pastor Ken, you are speaking very sort of Bible English. Yeah, the point I'm making is this. Please hear me. Don't miss this. Never be afraid to say, I am sorry in your relationship. Repairers learn to apologize. You say, Pastor Ken, uh, the way I am, action speaks louder than words. No, sir, that's not acceptable. Uh, I don't say I am sorry. I just act it out. It is not enough. It is not enough. The second law that we must learn is that nobody is too big to apologize in that relationship. We should take delight, you know, to, to apologize when we have done wrong. You are not weak when you apologize. It is not a show of weakness. I, I, actually, rather, it is a show of strength. It is a show of maturity that you are the bigger person. Learn to apologize. As Bible uh, children of God, apologizing is the social version of the spiritual act of repenting. In the spiritual, we do not just apologize to God, we repent. But in the social domain, the replication of that which is repentance in the spiritual is what we call apologizing in the social. And guess what? Nobody in the kingdom of God is too big to repent. Nobody. Even our Father, the Almighty God, once repented. Can you imagine? The Bible speaking to us says that Israel had offended God. You know, around that time that they built the golden calf and all, and God was upset and told Moses, I'm going to wipe out this whole uh, lineage. Then you and I will start a new line and raise a new nation unto my friend Abraham. I, know I did it before. When the whole earth upset me, I wiped them all out, and I kept only the family of Noah. And that's how I started this new, this new crop of people that you are seeing now. So if you don't mind, I'll wipe them out. Then you and I will start a new one. And the Bible says, a man called Moses took God to the corner and said that, if you do this, it's understandable. You, you have been vexed. These people have really offended you. But the Egyptians, they will think that you had power to bring them out, but you didn't have the power to take them in. So it was, act, it, it was actually out of your own frustration that you wiped them out. You started on a journey that you couldn't finish. You remember how you told us that whosoever wants to build a tower should first sit down and count the cost. The Egyptians so you didn't count the cost. So you started and realized you couldn't finish. That's why you wiped them out. And then the Bible says, the almighty God took the counsel of Moses and he repented. He repented. Did he eventually carry those people into the, into the promised land? No, he didn't. He didn't. He kept them in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation of those that offended him were wiped out, but they had now um, given birth to replacement children, grandchildren, and all of that before he took out those, those elders. But he took them all out. But he kept, uh, he kept their family lineage instead of wiping everybody out and starting afresh with Moses. 
you are not too big to apologize. You are not. As a matter of fact, when you don't apologize, you begin to make your partner feel less than what their real value is. That maybe that's why you never apologize. They don't really matter much. You know, then no, that's why I bought her a car. No, buying her a car is not an apology. It's not an apology. He said, no, that was why uh, then the next day I now give him sex like he has never had it before. Giving him superb sex is not an apology. Remember, life and death is in the power of the tongue. You have done something that is killing the relationship. Only what comes out of the mouth, life, that's what will recover it. I leave it there. Law number three for today which is number 11, no, number 12 in the count, is what I call the law of sacrifice. The law of sacrifice. Please, if you have any questions, just feel free to type it in. If it is very, very personal and you want to you want to send it to me directly so that the general group will not see it. What you do is that um, you go to the place where you are required to type in your message. You will see what appears there will be everyone. Then there's an arrow pointing down. So if you click on that arrow that points down, it will now allow you to choose who you want to send it to um, if it's not for everybody. So uh, host, that's myself. So if you send it to host, I will see it. Praise God. So I just thought you should know that. You know. So um, type in and send in the messages. We'll read it and then uh, the, the questions, and then we'll trash them during the Q and A. You know, but if you don't mind, you can only just type it in. Your question will bless somebody else. So you can put it in the general chat box and I'll write it down uh, when it's time to uh, have the interactive, then you can speak up. Uh, life. <clears throat> so law number three today, which is law number 12 in the count from, uh, from two weeks ago, is the law of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the dignity of a Christian marriage. Christian relationships, Christian, uh, Christ, Christian relationship with God and with one another hangs on the dignity of sacrifice. Jesus made a sacrifice to reconcile us back unto our Father God. And please mark this, of all the religions in the world, we are the only one that has their master and their leader die for them. We are the only one. We are the only one. And he didn't stay dead. He is resurrected. We are the only one that have it in our religion in our religion. So please understand this, that Jesus has set the example for you and me. He has set the example, you know, for you and me to sacrifice for one another. Why do we celebrate the great woman called Mother Teresa today? Not for her wealth, not for her books written, not for her conquest in technological invention, no, not for any of those. I mean, we venerate her and we celebrate her. Why? Because she represented this dignity of sacrificing for others. I know that a lot of, a lot of women grew up in homes where their mothers would say, oh, I'm sacrificing for my children. And there might just be some of them right now who still carry on with that philosophy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying sacrifice for your spouse, not your children. Children means family. We are talking marriage. That's the union between you and that woman, the union between you and that man. The dignity of that union hangs on the beauty of sacrifice. Learn to sacrifice for one another. Learn to sacrifice for one another. <clears throat> you know. Learn to sacrifice for one another. He said, but Pastor, what do I do if I keep sacrificing for 
my spouse and they don't reciprocate my sacrifices. I don't even think they appreciate my sacrifices. Remember why you are sacrificing. You are imitating Jesus. He that did not abandon his, his, his soul in Hades, even to the one that he cried and said, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And my God said, me forsake you, I will never forsake you. I will not allow your soul to see corruption, neither will I abandon it in hell. And on the third day, on the third day, he raised him up from the dead and granted him full justification for each and every one of us. I hope you are writing these things down. I hope that this become Bible lesson for you. I hope this become a revelation for you so you can understand our Christianity a lot, lot better. This thing of thinking that Christianity is about going to church is partly what is destroying us. We are ready to go to church, but we're not ready to build a culture and a character out of what church represents to us. We don't want to build a culture out of it. I don't want to digress to a lot of the other things that I'm studying on. I don't want to. You know, sacrifice. Law number four, <clears throat> which is number 13 in the lineup today, is what I call the law of deep personal knowledge, the law of personal knowledge. And it got to be the deep personal knowledge. This is the conveyor that carries the joy in every Christian relationship. The joy in our relationship is conveyed and engineered by deep personal knowledge of each other. You know, uh, my dear Auntie Boots, uh, um, my dear Uriyomi, whom I know is also a counselor to others, and my, my dear wife, and everybody on the, on the platform, please hear this. Christianity, as far as marriage is concerned, is fast losing its capacity to bring joy to the parties in the marriage. And one big reason is this, husband and wives, they don't talk deep things that concern them anymore. The only deep or serious thing that they ever talk about is uh, next tomorrow is 28. And you know that's the deadline for the payment of the this period. There's nothing else. But how we used to talk in dating and in our courtships, how we used to talk deeply about how we felt for one another, it's time to go back to it. It's time to be able to cry for you. It's time to be able to cry with you. It's time to be able to cry on you, resulting from deep personal conversation. There's nothing wrong in calling your partner and saying, I appreciate you so, so much. You know, one day David will write and say, "Ah, oh God, where shall I hide from your presence? Your presence is all over me. Even if I go into the darkness, darkness is light for you. But the next day, the same David will write and say, from the ends of the earth have I cried unto thee, oh God, hear my cry. So sometimes you feel loved and at other times you don't feel real loved. And you say to your partner, do you still love me? And please, when these conversations come up, don't use the back of the hand to wave it away. What are you talking about? I love you now. Where's this, where this coming from? What's going on? <laughs> Jesus. You, you got me worried uh, uh, right there. Stop that. Stop that stupid Hollywood, you know, cinematographic drama. Somebody just asked you a life changing question. Sit with them and then reassure them. I love you. You know, I know that I may not always get it right. I may not always get it right by you. 
I may, not all, I may not always say what you wish to hear. I may not always do what you want me to do. But sincerely, I love you from the bottom of my heart. I love you now much more than when we started this journey together because I know you better now. There are a lot of things I didn't understand about you, but now, five years after we got married, I understand you now. And I love you, my darling. Please let your heart know that you are safe in me and I will love you till I die. Yeah, Pastor Ken, all of this, uh, all of this mushy, mushy, mushy. Please, Pastor Ken, please hear me. Please hear me. You call it mushy, 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 mushy. That is the vis, that is the, that's what determines the viscosity in the oil of our relationship. The lubricant that keeps us going together, these are the things that maintain the viscosity of that lubricant. Don't wave it away. Eh? What are you talking about? Ah, where is this coming from? Who have you been talking to? Oh, no, my goodness. Uh, oh, okay. Let me even, let, let me turn the question around because now that we are at it, so you, do you love me? Or are you trying to set me up to now announce to me that you don't love me anymore? Or, uh, do you have somebody else? Please. Please. Let's learn to talk deep again. Let's learn to commit to knowing ourselves deeply and personally again. God has never asked any of you brothers to know all women, but he said you should try and know this one woman. God has not asked you to understand all men, my dear sisters. All God is saying is try and understand this one man. I think it was last year, uh, my wife, myself, uh, Ambassador Ndukwe, and other members of the faculty were doing a particular uh, uh, program. And I think it was even my wife that brought it up. And they said that men are so easy to, to know. The book on men is like this tiny, you know, New Testament. That's how thick the book on men is. But the book on women, <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. And I wasn't the one that said it was my wife. It's like this very encyclopedia kind <laughs> of or whatever. Then my wife now went a bit further and said, uh, men are so simplistic that men are like the, uh, the auto shift car. You have only two pedals, your brake and your throttle. So grab your steering, uh, adjust your gear stick, and you have only two pedals to deal with, fire or brake, fire or brake. But for the women, <clears throat> uh, they're like the Airbus 380. You know what I'm saying? With buttons all over you and all around you. And you got to know which button to touch, when to touch it, how to touch it. Otherwise, <laughs> your plane can go like this and crash. I'm telling you, what a woman is feeling or thinking, Two days before the menstrual cycle is totally different from what she is thinking the first day of the cycle, which is totally different from what she is feeling last day of the cycle, which is totally different from what she is feeling when ovulation is almost closed again, and then totally different from what she is feeling on the day of the ovulation, and then totally different from. <laughs> so you got to keep, you got to keep learning. You got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you press the wrong button on the wrong day. You crash the plane. And guess what? What makes the job simplified is that God didn't say study all of them, but one. Study, but one. So that your personal knowledge should go deeper and deeper. There's something that my wife used to say, and I think she still says it, you know, but it used to show up uh, in the early years of our marriage. You know, and uh, I, I, maybe I would have done something wrong or said something wrong, you know, and uh, by the time we're trying to, you know, uh, reconcile, she'll say to me, uh, I know you didn't mean it that way because I know your heart, you know. It's so critical for you to know one another's heart. I'm telling you, friends, I'm telling you, the one big philosophy of my life is I can forgive any weakness 70 times 70. But if I trace wickedness to you, 
you will be avoided for life. Because wicked people, they are not making mistakes. It is their deliberate design. What they have done, they will do it again. They mean to do it, no matter what their response and the facade is, they mean to do it. So study yourself deeper so that through deep and personal knowledge, <clears throat> you can always say, I know your heart. And um, Jesus went through this kind of uh, scenario with those who were close with him. You know, when he asked them um, in Matthew uh, 19, he said, that, who do men say that I am? And they all began to <clears throat> say what was popular uh, opinion about him. Some say you are, you, are, you are the prophet. Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah, you know. And sometimes in relationships, people are stuck with the, uh, with the general knowledge. All men are like this. You can't treat your husband on the predicate of that. All men are like this. You can't go far with that. I have no apostle 10. I may have made up my mind though, because all women, you can't go far if you keep riding on that so called all men, all women are like that. Because the next thing was that Jesus said, So who do you say that I am? There was dead silence in the place. And sometimes it hurts in love relationships when you've been with someone for so long and you close your eyes and you realize that they don't know me. <laughs> they don't even want to know me. They are just joining with me in life, but they don't know me. That hurts. That's tough. So Jesus said to them, so who do you say that I am? Then Peter spoke up. Please hear me. I know there's a lot of um, revelations and um, extrapolations on the basis of um, ecclesiastical analysis and all of those. But let's use it for love relationships. So Jesus says, who, so who do you say that I am? Then Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And here was Jesus' response. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And the principle for us today is this. Deep personal knowledge is the fortitude that keeps the relationship impregnable to all adversities. I will build my church upon this rock of this personal knowledge that you have of me and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When we have deep personal knowledge about one another, it creates protection, it creates fortitude, it creates security to that relationship. The type of security that nothing from outside will jab at it and be able to penetrate. Because you know, you know yourselves. You know yourselves. The last law I want to deal with today, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, just 10 more minutes. I always like to give at least um, half an hour for us to have interactions. So the last one I want to deal with today, uh, which is number five for today, but in the lineup, it will be number, it will be number 14. It will be number 14 out of our 20. It is the law of, Love identity, love identity. I want you to become a love vendor, particularly on this occasion of celebrating Father's Day, which we did yesterday across the world. Let us remind ourselves of some of the, of the pillar characters that make us the kind of father that the heavenly father wants us to be on earth. Let us become known for being love vendors, love vendors. Let us become reconcilers, a man of peace, 
a man who is always looking for ways to repair what is broken. Let each and every one of us recommit and rededicate ourselves to our love identity in Christ Jesus. Let me say this. The love that God has for us is also the motivation for the love that God asks of us. The love that God has for us is also the predicate for the love that he has asked of us. So in John 13, you see that first Jesus washed their feet. Then he now said to them, if I, your Lord and your master, have done this to you, now a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just the same way that I have loved you. And hereby shall all men know that you are my disciples. What does it mean by all men? Black, white, African, American, Caucasian, Indian, whatever the nationality, this is the master key to represent me to, to your world, love. That you have love one for another. This love should become our primary identity. Don't just love your wife, even though that's the focal point of our discussion, but become a lover, a vendor of love for all. Don't just love your children, but become one who is identified with the capacity to love. Don't just love your friends, but become that one person that even those who are not your friends, they know that it's a blessing to be your friend because you love everyone. I'm not talking about that love you love just because of what you got to get. No, I'm talking about the love you love because that is who you want to be. It's amazing that Jesus never said that our identity to the world would be the power of our prayer, or our preaching, or our healing the sick. No, he said, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples and you have love for one another. So please write this down. Nine characters of this love, and I close. <clears throat> Nine characters of this love. Number one, you've got to be compassionate and affectionate. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, from verse 22 to verse 23, the Bible speaking says that against this, there is no law. This love thing, there's no access to it. There's nothing like too much love. There's nothing like that. You know? Yeah, and I think it's uh, our dear sister, Mercy Chingo, that sang that song. Jesus, you love me too much, too much, oh, too much love. You know? Beautiful song. And I'm, God is calling us to the same thing. That you, you cannot overdo this. You know? It's love that is characterized with compassion. And affection. Number two, it got to be that love that brings joy, humor, and sponsoring happiness. <laughs> Let me say something, and please don't stone me, don't fight me. Okay? If your relationship does not have, does not bring happiness to your partner, you are no longer in the spirit. <laughs> Ah, no, Pastor Ken, we, we are past that happiness level. We, we are just, we are very matured now. We don't laugh too much. We just, <laughs> no, sir. Don't let joy, laughter, humor, and happiness ever deplete from your love relationship. Number three, this love should come with it. Peace, peacefulness, peace, peacefulness, peaceableness reconciliation. Let peace always be your focal point. Peace. Peace. I know some of you grew up in homes where the, the trading currency in that home is wahala. You know, it's wahala. Even when they say, how are you in that home, the best way to answer how are you is, get out my friend. And they say, that's how we joke. No, sir. No, sir. Let your love be characterized with peace, <coughs> peacefulness, 
peaceableness, reconciliation. Don't, don't give room to malice in any way. Number four character to this love as our identity is long suffering. Say, Pastor, what is long suffering? Long suffering is you being capable of remaining unchangeable in your loyalty and in your commitment to God and to that relationship despite the circumstances of life. You just won't shift. You are so consistent, consistently committed. Number five character of this love is gentleness. You see, it's Christianly to be a gentleman. It is Christianly to be a lady. You know, all of this ragamuffin type of character, it's not traceable to our Bible heritage. Love is gentle. Gentleness, being tender, being respectful, esteeming others. You know, uh, the other has been better than yourself. Not that they are better, but you are the one esteeming them thus, you know, because you just want them to feel better about themselves when they are in your presence. Yeah. The sixth character, so that we can take the questions, is your goodness, your kindness. Write this down, never stingy. Never stingy. Check out the meaning of the word stingy in the Wikipedia. Never stingy. Never tight-handed. You should always be that person who's always making others happy with what you have. Making them happy with what you have. Empowering them to become fulfilled when they're in your presence because you are like what we call uh, the prodigal lover. The word prodigal is not negative, even though some of us will think the word prodigal is negative because when we study about the parable of the prodigal son, it sounds like the negative son, the rebellious son. No, the word prodigal actually means the reckless spender that keeps spending until there's nothing left. That's prodigal. The father in that story was the prodigal father. The prodigal son took what he had, went to a far country and wasted it all until there was nothing left. But when he returned, he met with a prodigal father who was ready to keep giving and giving and giving until there was nothing left. You should be a prodigal lover. Somebody, and break the spell of selfishness in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody just felt a touch of the spirit as I was talking about that prodigal father and the prodigal son. I want you to arise from where you are and determine that I will no longer look to my partner to determine how generous I'm going to be. If they want to be selfish, that's them. You know better. If they want to be stingy, that's them. Don't imitate it. God's character is prodigal, recklessly spending all he has until there's nothing left. This, this love we're talking about is about faith. You've got to walk by faith. You've got to walk by faith. I have one more minute and I'll finish this. It's about faith. It's about faithfulness. It's about keeping your promise. It's about keeping your word. It's about treating marriage and marriage relationships as covenant, not a contract. It's about a determination to always act in real life like the word of God is real. You're always acting in real life like the word of God is real. Is there heaven? Yeah. Is that a motivation for us? Yes. Is the word of God really real? Yeah. How do you know? Look at me. I've eaten from that word and I'm ready to feed those around me with the reality of what the word of God dispenses. And number nine, the last of the, uh, the number eight of the characters, meekness, meekness, teachableness. That is, you, are, you know so much, yet you're always maintaining or keeping your powerfulness under control. <laughs> I think it was 
maybe about um, 14 years ago or 15 years, yeah, about 14 years ago, you know, my wife and I were, you know, uh, standing, I think, outside the Nikon Luxury Hotel and we're interacting with the great Dr. Kwanam Pesip Hall, you know, and uh, my wife surprised him by letting him know there was a particular song he had not yet waxed, uh, but it was, you know, how he would sing his songs in concert before he puts them in an album. And my wife could do that song so beautifully, you know. Uh, then we're now talking about humility. And this was what he said. He said, humility is power under control. Give me a second. Please give me a second. Uh, what is this? Uh, give me a second. What is that? Thank you. All right, so um, this was tattooed me right there. Um, so uh, Panam said, uh, Dr. Panam said that uh, humility is power under control. It's not that you are powerless, but you are so meek, you are so teachable, you know so much, yet you are able to maintain, you know, your power and what you know, and you bring them under control. You are always giving others the benefit of a doubt. You are always forgiving freely, even before you get the apologies from the other person. This is what this love entails. And lastly, the ninth, uh, ninth character of this love is temperance. Temperance, having control over your own spirit. The Bible says that this is far more critical than taking a city. You know, that he that has no control over his own spirit is like a city without walls. You know, anything can, can encroach upon it. So that you are not easily provoked. You should always take the light, you know, uh, that you, you are not easily provoked. You never take the light to put anyone down. Even when you are dealing with your offenders, no excesses. No excesses. These are the characters of the love that God is calling us to. And let me tell you, if you have this as the general foundation to your personal love life, you can never fail. You can never fail. I'm not saying that the first person you fall in love with might be the right person to marry, but you will never fail. Because when you move from person to person trying to find the one that you are going to spend the rest of your life with, it will be so clear, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Lola. Love vendors, reconcile us, man of peace, repair of the bridge. Hallelujah. Thank you. You know, you will never fail in your, in your relationships. Why? Because you are a love vendor. You are carrying this character of God, you know, uh, through the banner of love, you know. And whoever makes contact with you and leaves you, they are likely going to use you as a benchmark for wherever they are going because you are just so exemplary. Hallelujah. So these are the five uh, laws I wanted us to discuss today. I hope you've made some notes. I hope you've written down some questions. I hope uh, you've made observations, you know, so that um, uh, as I hand over the meeting, to my wife, the black one, hallelujah, so that um, <laughs> I love, I love how this really, really whoops you. It does not. It's, it does. it's actually my face of empathy. 
<laughs> I'm, when I'm feeling for the other woman who are carried away by these things, it is my empathy face. Please try and lend my empathy face. Like, yeah, another one by the nurse. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so, so for the story, I hope you can help us uh, love so much like Christ that it is difficult to forget you quickly. Thank you, Lola. Like that. You know, I hope you're able to help us with Q and A today. Well, I'll do my best. Well done, on these fantastic, practical, doable word. Um, if you are truly a child of God, it's not so much of what you say; it's what you do. And these are tips. Many people want to grow their love lives, but they 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 are stuck with not knowing what to do, what to do. So they only talk about prayer, prayer. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. But we know that marriage is 90% practical and 10% spiritual. 10% prayer, 10% fasting, 10%. It's 90% practical. And anybody who just subscribes to these 10 laws will get better, even if you start with baby steps, you know. Um, I, I, there are 10 laws and I have all 10. So I don't know who wants to start. Our challenge is always how to stop starting, you know. If, so if you have a question deep in your heart now, this is the best time to bring it out. So I, I had one that I wrote down as you spoke. Yeah. about um, the law of deep personal knowledge yeah. where you were saying it's the conveyor that keeps the relationship going. You said a lot of couples no longer deeply talk and I agree to this. Communication is so broken and I was you know, speaking about father the other day. I said children will not tell you big issues in their lives if they can't trust you with little matters. And many times when people fail in handling the little things about their lives, then they will be afraid to commit the bigger things, you know, to you. You said couples no longer have big, deep talks. And I'm like, that is so true. I like to ask why, what happened? You used to have deep, true, you know, connections, deep, real issues. And sorry about that. I tried to turn off the videos when they are running across. But okay, you know. So what happened? Why do couples have deep issue, deep conversations anymore? We must always be able to track back to the last deep issues hard. What went wrong? No marriage joy dies. I think you had one that said this sometime back that the divorce court is the place where you bury the shells. You didn't observe when it cracked. You didn't observe when it started leaking. You didn't observe. These were times that they could have, that relationship could have been salvaged and saved. But many times people run away from having real conversations. And it goes back to one strong point, I believe. When couples are afraid to fight, it is the beginning of the end. Fight in a Christian relationship is not um, fight as in fiscal, but to have divergent opinions. To say, well, I've heard what you have said, but I don't agree with what you have said. Do you understand? What you have said is actually maybe dishonoring to me, which is your number 10 law. How can you even think such thoughts of me? It's dishonoring. And the person that's saying this to should not feel, how can you say I dishonor you? Thank God you even brought the balance to it when you were saying, oh, um, you know, um, you said, um, oh, sorry, when you dishonor the principle that binds a relationship, you're on your way to destroying it. Be careful how you dishonor God and principles. Look for the person who honors your parents too. And you now said that um, the, the woman should be careful how she speaks to her husband, you know? And I was putting it in a, an invited comma when you now said, and the man should be careful how he speaks to the wife as well, because honor is such a big deal. Anyway, let me go back to the matter of the personal connection. You said you must you must cry 
You must find that person that you cry to, the person you cry with, the person you cry for, the person you cry on. And I'm like, wow, wouldn't a relationship be so deep and powerful when your spouse is that person you cry to? But when do they lose this debt? And when is it? Hmm, how do you fix it when it's not there anymore? When do they lose these deep connections and how do they fix it? Well, I asked the question here, I said, what if that person doesn't love you anymore? How do you fix it? Absence of love, as we know, it's not agape, not covenant and all of those. When this person can't find the you to cry on, when this person can't find you to cry to, when they cried to you once, twice, and they did not like your handling, you probably didn't hear half of what the person was saying. How do you fix this? That was the question that I, I wrote down. The floor is open. Yeah, so the question this, is uh, concerning deep personal knowledge. Yes. I have said that we no longer do it. Your question is, why did we stop doing it? And how yes. can how, we how, build yes. it and recover it if it is broken? How can we recover deep personal conversations you know, with one another? Who wants to help us? Yes. Auntie Boos, I hope you are still free to speak. Auntie Boos, I, I hope she's still around. She needed to go off. Okay. She sent a private message that she was going to right. leave at a point. Yeah. Talola, if you if you can uh, come on, how do we reconnect this when it has been broken? Uh, uh, but, but, but thank you for this question, Ma. I really want to know too. Okay, somebody else is waiting to know. Uh, so, um, Sister Lola Olaide Steven, if you can uh, unmute, what do you think can be done to reconnect? when the deep personal connection between the parties has been broken and maybe one of the parties already feels like i don't really love love you anymore i have a gap a bit i don't have that personal thing for you anymore yeah what do you think um good evening everyone um it's actually a very very uh, deep and wide question so uh, because of time I think the most important thing is um, we must learn to trust again. There's no one who has not been bruised and battered before. Oh. And the reason sometimes also um, is because um, expectations have not been met. Oh. Uh, sometimes we um, also overlook uh, the humanity oh. um, of the offender or, or the, how does it the offender now? The person who has offended you, we overlook the humanity of that person. And that's why the expectations are high. Mm -hmm. uh, be that as it, may, uh, as it may, someone has offended you. The most important thing is you must ask yourself, um, what are your principles? What are you living by? The scripture that says if somebody has offended you, then you should go um, 70 times 7. means that, number one, you must realize that you are commanded. And sometimes the commandment of God is not something that is pleasant, is not palatable. So for everyone who is a God pleaser and who also uh, progressively wants to know God, you know, there's a scripture that says, then shall we know if we follow on to know. So as we follow progressively to know God, we will want to be God pleasers. And a God pleaser is somebody who will cringe to offend God. So align yourself with God by letting go because you know that it is a commandment that God has given unto us. So your obedience to that commandment is more important than the hurt that you are having. Um, during this conversation, you said something about knowledge. Mm -hmm. Having a deep knowledge of the divine principles of God is where a lot of gaps, I've seen a lot of gaps in Christendom. And once we have that knowledge and understanding, right, it is easier for us to behave according to what we know. So uh, 
everybody's action is a function of what they know or what they do not know. So for me, the easiest thing is, you know what? God has commanded forgiveness. So you need to first ask yourself, Lord, I need the grace to do your will and purpose by forgiving. That's the only thing I will say. It's just praise ask God Allah. to give you that strength and that grace. Yes, please. Um, I, I love what you have said, and it's very true. Um, but when it's relationship and it's a couple, yeah. sometimes I think the emotions get really intertwined. God, you, I don't know if you heard what I said, that marriage is 90% practical and 10% mm. spiritual. I agree with forgiveness. But what if the person you are dealing with is a mm. mutual? What if this yes. person is mm. helpless, helplessly mm. doing wrong? Mm. I spoke with someone who's caught a disease four times because she mm. has a reckless husband mm. who is a principal, is not a, is not a <clears throat> you person, is just weak in this area yeah. of his life. So he would say, I'm not going to do it again, but he's gone, and she keeps mm. coming down with um, diseases. We have a friend who caught a terminal disease because of a husband who could not help himself. Now she is permanently in arms way because she kept going back. Now, how do you get emotionally entangled with a person okay. who keeps doing this? Yeah. And it can be across board, it can be financial responsibility, it can be womanizing, it can be, yeah. you understand what I mean? How yeah. do you- okay. Let me, let me address that as well. You know, uh, the first statement I made was that is a big, is a wide and a deep question. The first thing I've said is the platform. That's the platform. That is a given, right? And um, if you want to say that's in the 10%. Number two also is that um, sometimes it's important to get people involved in our matters. Um, there's a lot of shame that I see in Christendom, you have a problem with your spouse. Um, you've seen a glaring weakness and you think, let me just pray about it. Um, if I tell people, they will think I'm not spiritual. If I tell people, um, they will think um, I, I, I don't have my acts together. But the truth is asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Asking for help is a sign of strength. So there is nobody who should not have that person that you can actually confide in and say, look, my life is falling apart. So on the platform of truth, that person first needs someone to speak to. That's number one. And a brother in that instance, for example, let me just use that as an example, who is helpless, has been taken over by something against his will. So, but the man would ordinarily not go and seek for help. Apart from ego, right? Um, he may think he can fix it. So sometimes you can even circumvent your spouse in that instance and go look for help for him. Because for example, if the man is sick physically, you would have to drag him to the hospital even if he resists. At some point he will succumb, you know, and then um, he will probably go to the hospital. So you mean someone needs to go, you know, and ask for help. The wife needs to go and ask for help. Um, one of the ministries that is, missing in Christendom right now is the Ministry of Counselors. And I, I tell you why, paid counseling as well, paid counseling. You know, it's not every time that um, someone can actually tell you um, this is your problem. There's a psychotherapy um, element that a lot of people are battling with. You know, it's a mental issue. So a psychotherapist may need to come on board. A counselor may need to come on board, right? Um, a person that you know the man, if he trusts someone or believes in someone, like a body, an accountability partner may also come you know, um, into play in this type of situation. For that woman, you know, there's no point. The Bible says if we have hurt, bitterness, anger against one another, lie not against the truth. 
The woman needs to live her truth of the situation in which she is. I can't go ahead because um, this man has exposed me, so to say. This is a situation in which I find myself. He's falling over and over again to this same situation and it seems as if there's no remedy. So while she's crying out to God and telling God, I don't even think this matter can be fixed, she should seek for help. Honestly, she should seek for help and she should have a conversation with you know, the man as often as she has the strength and the energy, but she must also seek a tribe of women who would help her out because it can be tiring, it can be very emotive and it can be draining. It's not a time to stand alone. You can't stand alone when you're in this type of situation. You can't stand alone at all. The isolation that, um, how would I say, bewitches a lot of people is actually what leads to their downfall. So you can't afford, you know, uh, to fall prey, you know, to that isolation. Everything about the woman's pride needs to be taken away, right? And the woman needs to also let the Lord know that love has has flown out of the window. Trust has flown out of the windows. Emotions have flown out of the window. Recognizing, you know, the commandment of God does not mean that we deny our emotions and we deny how we feel about it. It, you know, there are two separate things. One is one is commanded, but at the same time, God has also given us, you know, um, has given us our faculties to think and to act accordingly because there's a principle that also guides what we do. So uh, counsel, um, intervention, uh, looking for people, um, asking for help and strength, and then um, seeking for help, you know, in the right direction. You know, so those, those would be the first, you know, um, those would be my own immediate thoughts, you know, around it, you know, but at the same time, um, it's difficult to give a prescriptive um, response in this sort of situation because Sometimes it's on case by case basis, but at least we know that counsel, you can't go wrong if you get it from the right, uh, the right angle. We know that uh, seeking help from people uh, who have gone ahead of you, a confident, a man of God, trusted, um, a sister trusted, you know, um, like I mentioned, psychotherapist or a body or a friend trusted, those ones also can't even, um, they, are, they are support systems, you know, that that kind of person needs to. Um, uh, bring into play as well because the truth is um, even your spouse that hasn't committed that level of sin hurts you your love uh, uh, bank goes down, it's drained and you need to know to, to fill it up back again, it will take a while how much more in this kind of instance you know that you have mentioned you know? so that would be my own contribution um, awesome. at least awesome. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. well said, thank you you brought the balance because we tend to make every solution spiritual and that's why I stretched it a little more so that it can accommodate many more people. So the, thank you, thank you, Sister Lola. Thank you, Ma. So the floor is open, a couple, we have about to be married couple here. This is your opportunity. Um, people are already married. What is your experience? Out of all the 10, which did you learn? Which is today to practice. We, we, we did five today. Okay, yeah, yeah, from number ten. At Fourteen in all so far that we have done since the first. Yes. Week. Then the nine characters of love, which I guess took you oh, from. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. So the first of, yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Okay, through your question, there was a word that dropped in my heart. Um, um, it's, it's okay. Who is speaking, please? Is this okay? I, I, okay, I'm... okay, Carol. Okay, okay, Ichinom. Hi, yeah. how are you? Okay, you please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15, where the Bible talks about long forbearance and calmness of spirit. Mm -hmm. So for me, by my own personal experience. Situations come and it's overwhelming. And those are the ingredients that I lacked. Now by lacking that, um, truth is, and another thing I want to say, I will, I will join it together. Like um, Sister Lola was talking about looking for counsel and looking for a tribe that cares, you know? One of the things that I noticed is 
it's a man's world. It's a man's mm. world. So even when you stretch out looking for counseling, you realize that all that is given to you is prayer. Mm. And that for me, it was very frustrating. Why? Because I didn't find counsel. And I took through, like, while you're going through the pain, while, you're going, while, while your capacity is being stretched, while your forbearance is being tested, you found a tribe. By the time you broke, it was as though nobody knew you were going through anything. They trivialized all your claims. Now, it made mm. me, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be very sincere. It made me feel like there are no safe spaces within the church. Mm. Why? Because all that they would tell you to do is pray as though you have not been praying. Meanwhile, you went to them first. You express everything that you're going through with them first. But by the time you get to the place where you need help, where I have broken down, I need help. All that they see is the fact that your forbearance is missing. That for me was more of the burden. The, that was the burden that I carried rather than the problem that I faced. So mm. the looking for the safe spaces, looking for the counsel is the problem, it's tough. Christian women usually would hide these things. They would not be sincere with you because they feel like anything they say is more like they are the ones telling you what decision to take. Meanwhile, it's about caring for me as well. Thinking about me as a human, sometimes you care about me. When you care about me, it takes me back to grace for forbearance. But when you care about the marriage, what I care about me, I was exhausted. That's my contribution. Well said, sweetheart. It is well with you. Don't forget that we are still dealing with humans at the end of the day, like you rightly said. Even the person you went to may not even be in that safe space to help in that moment. So the Bible says, in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. And I think um, finding this accountability partners or team or tribe that Sister Lola talked about, it's prayerfully sought. You really don't want to put your business out there with any and every. You understand? Before you find your outlet, where you pour and pour, you must have been tested and trusted. Somebody like me, I'm the most closed book I know. I don't know how to talk about myself. I'm a good listener. I love Gary burdens, but to open, ah, it's just, I, I think maybe because I went through issues growing up. So I must know that you are a fortress indeed. Do you understand? To be able to pour out. And all you need to get me to close up is one, one classic failure is enough. You won't even know. I'm just like that spirit of God that is described in the day, in the, in the story of Samson. I did not even know. He said he wished not that the spirit had left. So it's not everybody that, that's why I'm raising these topics that the husband is talking about. Let's talk about it in practice ways. One person is not enough to bring this failure. Do you understand? If you were in that space where you had sought a counsel, the Bible talked about multitude of counsel. No marriage, as far as I'm concerned, no marriage is that bad. It may just be that one is focusing on the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad, that it got so colored by the black, bad colors that even when that you refuse to acknowledge that there is any good in the marriage until that bad, you bled out. You bled out. You bled out, focusing on really the bad. No human is that bad. No human is that bad. But it is what it is. If you still need to call us after now for us to talk a bit more, please do. So sorry about your experience. I guess it's a real world out there. Sorry. Does anyone have another contribution, question about what, what we've discussed tonight? We have the law of honor. We have the law of repair. We have the law of sacrifice. We have the law of deep personal knowledge. We have the law of love. Or is that, well, love, law of love identity, becoming a love icon, becoming that um, what is that word now? That, 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 you, you, are, you are a vendor, you are a dispenser 
of love. Everywhere you go, you're minded of to carry the love of God. And then we have the nine characters of love. What are your questions? We have, in fact, our time is almost up. What are your questions? What is your contribution? What's your experience? Who wants to say something before we draw the curtain tonight? We have Carol, we have Ibidun, we have Adiza, we have Yoma, Uriyomi, Blanley, Deji, Jemiyo. We have Shage, Temi Tope, Obafemi Bosse, Stanley, JB, Selena. Oh, it's a very robust house. Wow, Stai Dou is around. Dr. Jack, Tope, Onero, Obaro, Ishinom. So yeah. please. That, that, that even reminds me, Dr. Jack has an outreach that also deals with, you know, relationships. So, uh, Sister Jack, if you're in a good place to speak, what's your take from uh, these discussions today? What stands out, you know, for you and from your interactions with others who are having challenges with their relationships? What would you say is the big question we should have addressed here tonight? If you are free to speak kindly, unmute. Okay, so that may mean that she's not free to speak. All right, our time is up. Like I always say to you, it's bedtime on your side, on my <laughs> side, it's work time. It is so work time. You get to spare as many minutes as uh, you wish for extra, extra. I got to go, I got to go. Uh, hallelujah. All right, thank you all so much for taking time to join us today. Thank you, honey, for wonderful anchorage. And uh, thank you, Sister uh, Lola. Sister Lola Olaide Stephen uh, is one of my teenage growing up friends. So we've known ourselves for about 34 years. Yeah, we all knew ourselves uh, as young people before we got admissions to go to the university. And I'm glad you agreed that you're old now. You were young people then. No, very no, good, very good. Like you that. are said by your words. Thank you for no, using that word. Thank you not, for letting us know you were once young, but now you are old. It's, it's not like that. I mean, when we're younger. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. Uh, and if you still have questions, remember, you can reach out to my wife, Mama T, or to myself. You can reach out zero eight zero. Uh, 3320 or you can reach me on 416-409-0566, preceded with plus one for Canada. Thank you all so much. Let me bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the spirit of reconciliation. You are a great reconciler. You never desire that anyone should perish. You always dig about us. You always manure us and give us another extra length and lease of time to bear fruit. Our God and our Father, there are people going through pains. There are people going through situations that they can't even find someone to talk to, but you are there and you are able to help. Now I ask in the name of Jesus that thou God of all comfort, you will stretch out your hand in a unique way this week. You will intervene and intercept that flow of negativity, oh God. Help us, your people, oh God. Help, I pray. Help. Help and bring us out. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Have a great week, everyone. God bless you. My honey bunny, love you forever. Have a good week. God bless you. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, AB. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Thank you, Doc Ben. Thank you, Sister Dowo. It's so good to see you all. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Sister Shade, thank you. Had these are my princess. And my evangelist from Trinidad. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Huoma. Thank you, Bolanli. Thank you, Timmy Tokbe. And our dear administrator, IB. Thank you, sir. God bless you guys. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night, Carol.